All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next speaker is Mark Sherman. He's the director at Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. Please join me in welcoming Mark to our virtual stage. Thank you, Richrika. Let's uh, set up everything here. Welcome everybody to the session on transfer learning applications and deep fake videos. I'm Mark Sherman. I'm one of the directors of the Cybersecurity Foundations at CERT. CERT, uh, where I come from, is part of the Software Engineering Institute, a uh, funded research and development center by the Department of Defense, focusing on cybersecurity, software engineering, and artificial intelligence. Uh, we are part of Carnegie Mellon University which is ranked pretty much in the top of all the subfields of computer science, including number one as a software engineering institute in AI cybersecurity and software engineering. And in particular, the CERT division was founded at the request of DARPA back in 1988 in response to the Morris Word. So in some sense, we are the birthplace of cybersecurity and we have worked with the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, other federal agencies and the private sector to improve the, both the uh, science and the practice of cybersecurity. Clearly one of the emerging elements, one of the emerging risks in cybersecurity is fakes of various kinds. And so today we're gonna to spend a little bit of time talking about deep fakes. Uh, we'll start with some examples that represent a kind of potential. Uh, unlike other kinds of cyber attacks, there aren't really a lot of, uh, of deep fake attacks uh, that have done a, a lot of damage. They have done a lot of, uh, of hurt. Uh, but there are potentials, and we can see some of those potentials uh, emerging in some examples. Uh, for one example, uh, this kind of technology was used to fake the voice of a particular uh, executive. And so the CEO of a company uh, actually wired over nearly a quarter of a million dollars uh, to effectively an anonymous place because he thought his boss was telling him to do so. And as a result, uh, they wound up uh, with a cyber criminal uh, getting this money based on uh, fake generated voice using this kind of technology. Most of the other examples here are not quite as specific. Uh, for example, someone used this technology uh, to, uh, to create photos of women into nudes. Uh, it was called Deep Nude. It fortunately was only up for a little while and then it came back down once people understood really what was going on. But it used this technology uh, frankly, the person who did this was not necessarily a, an expert in this kind of technology, which shows that it's readily accessible for people to do these kinds of things. Uh, the final example I would use, again, the intention was benign. Uh, here that the intention was to allow people to sort of put themselves in TV shows or movies and you know, have them uh, be as if uh, they were the actors in the movie. This was done in China, which you might have expected would have tighter controls on these kinds of things than you would see in the Western world. But nevertheless, uh, it went viral within China where people really wanted to be able to uh, face swap uh, themselves and various kinds of famous actors and TV characters. So the technology is here. Again, there hasn't been the same kind of, of uh, hurt that's been caused by other kinds of cybersecurity attacks, but you can envision how this technology might be used in the future for other kinds of attacks as the technology gets more mature. So how might that happen? How might you get this technology into places that it wouldn't be and therefore uh, able to cause damage that, is, uh, that uh, uh, an adversary wishes to inflict? To do that, we should look a bit about how these things are constructed, what the weak points are, and how we can look at things. So let's talk a little bit first about how these kinds of things are constructed. And in particular, I want to focus on one particular technique called transfer learning. So here we have a somewhat uh, exa an example of a deep neural network structure. Uh, the idea is that at the far left side, you get input. So it's, let's put, use uh, visual pictures as an example. So uh, each point on the left is a point on the picture coming in. And then you have the sequences of layers. And at each layer, it takes uh, a collection of the inputs from the previous layer, weighted in some way. So that top uh, 
uh, uh, circle in the in the second layer, they weight the first the topmost input you know half, and they weight the bottommost input a third or what have you. And from that, it then comes up with a calculation of whatever interesting feature it is trying to extract. In, in this example, uh, this first layer uh, called the hidden layer because you generally don't see the outputs of these uh, is trying to look for edges. So if it sees certain combinations of let of the first input layer in certain values, then it says it's discovered a, in a uh, edge. The next layer works in long similar kind of way. Now it's looking at com combinations of edges and says, oh, this looks like an eye, this looks like a mouth. And again, it does that by using various weighted uh, amounts of what uh, was sees in the previous layer. In this example, the third layer is now trying to construct a face. Is it a face with a mustache? Is it a face that's uh, bald? Is it a woman's face? Again, it uses weighted values of the previous layers to come up with a calculation of what it thinks is seen. And then that goes to the final layer. That final layer then says, this is a picture of Billy. This is a picture of Sally. And it bases that again on a weighted collection of the previous things here seen in hidden layer three. So at each stage, you're taking the other inputs, you're combining them in some way in order to extract more and more kinds of information. Now, to look a little bit deeper, but not much, we're not going to do a whole lot of math, um, we can look at some of these numbers that are used. Uh, so in this case, there's three kinds of inputs that are coming in, and you build these by effectively filling in, if, to make it simple, random numbers um, for all these different kinds of weights and the nodes and the edges. And as you put in uh, training data, examples, uh, for example, let's say you want to look at bananas, find something that looks at bananas. Uh, you take in a banana, it will come through, it'll do it, this kind of calculation. And then at the far right, one of the nodes, let's say that top node will fire and say, I think I've seen a banana. If in fact you fed it a banana to begin with, you would say, okay, then these numbers look pretty good. If, he say, if in fact you fed it an apple to begin with, you would say, well, that's not right, the error and that's what you're really measuring, the error between what you expect and what you actually have, uh, says that these numbers ought to be tweaked. And again, there's some straightforward calculations that are done in order to change all the weights of the nodes and the edges that you see here. Now, after you feed it many, many examples, um, the numbers in there start to converge and you come up with what you consider to be an acceptable rate. So at the back end, you may say at 95% of the time, it guessed correctly that it was a banana, and you say that's good enough. Uh, there will never be perfection. These systems are statistical. Obviously, you're not going to look at every single picture of banana that exists. And so you need to come up with a criteria or a set of criteria by which you will say whether this uh, particular neural net is operating at the way you want. So there's a lot of numbers that have to be done and a lot of samples that have to be looked at. Uh, typically, you'll have hundreds to millions of these kinds of examples that have to be fed of pictures of bananas or dogs or cats or oranges or whatever it is that you're looking at in order to generate these numbers. Now, in this example, we have, what, about 15 nodes, maybe about 50 edges. Uh, it's very modest kind of numbers. In sort of real examples, uh, for example, the recently released GPT-3 uh, deep neural net for natural language processing, it has 175 billion parameters. So imagine how many updates have to be done every time you, you, treat, you give it a, a new kind of sample image of a banana, or in this case, it's natural language processing, a, a piece of text, in order for it to recalculate what those numbers should be. That is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of computation power. Building these things from scratch is a very difficult thing to do. And so people try to find shortcuts. And that's what um, transfer learning is. So if I could be somewhat crude, transfer learning is the cut, paste, tweak version of machine learning that people uh, do in other kinds of computer programming. So it starts with having a trained neural network uh, here called the teacher network. Instead of having the individual circles, we just have these uh, rectangles representing each of the layers there. And we divide all of the layers in the teacher in two parts. Uh, one part we're going to keep and one part we're going to retrain. So you start by uh, making a copy and throwing away the last stage, the thing that says this is an orange or a banana or this is Billy or Sally. You throw away that one entirely and you start that one over from scratch. You then start feeding it new kinds of data. So let's pretend that the teacher was recognizing bananas for sake of argument and you keep feeding it uh, examples of oranges because you want to build something that can recognize oranges. And what you will do 
is you will rebuild that last stage completely from scratch and you will uh, 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 move or uh, update the last, in this case, N layers. So the first K layers in the example here won't be touched at all. Even if under other circumstances, you might adjust them to look at oranges instead of bananas, you're not going to. Instead, you're only going to adjust the last uh, N layers in order to do that. And what you wind up with is something that can now recognize oranges instead of recognizing bananas. Now, the reason why this works, uh, let's take uh, images and pixels, for example, is because uh, it's not a very dense space. That's a technical way of saying most times we just pick random uh, pixels in a picture, you would see garbage. It's not even well-defined noise. And as a result, there's very relatively few things, pixel values that represent a picture, whether it's an apple or an orange or a banana or a cat or a dog. Uh, it's a very, very small subset of the potential pictures or pixel values that represent a picture that you could look at. And as a result, bananas and dogs to a first approximation have a, much, have a lot in common that allow you to use this kind of trick. However, you can imagine that if you can put something into that teacher that can be carried all the way into the student, you've now inserted the ability to subjugate what the system is doing. So how you might do that? Well, let's take a look at how one creates some deep fakes. And we're going to look at one of the more popular techniques called the autoencoder-based deep fake generation. Uh, there are many variants on this scheme. It's not the only one, but it's one of the more popular ones. So let's take a look at how this is done. Uh, we start with an original face. Let's say it's, it's me. And we are going to build a neural network that can extract out key features of my face. So uh, where my lips are, how far apart my eyes are, uh, whatever other kinds of things that uh, can really abstract out the interesting features of my face. And we call that the encoder. And it generates as it, an encoded version of my face. Not, uh, uh, no uh, special uh, thing there for the name. Now we build a second part called a decoder, which you can think of as a reconstructor. So it takes the abstract vision of my face, you know, how far apart my eyes are, uh, you know, how, how open my mouth is, and can recreate my face based on those changes. So when I'm happy, my lips go up. When I'm unhappy, I have a frown. Those are the key latent things that are kept as features and it reconstructs the rest of my face because it learned how the rest of my face looked. Again, it was trained with lots of copies of my face. As a result, you now have a system that can start with my face, extract out the unique things that are going on in my face for now, and then use that to completely recreate my face. We can now encode and reconstruct a master. In this case, I'm pretending to be the master <clears throat> in this uh, scenario. Now, one can do the same kind of process for a target. So let's pretend I want to manipulate you. So I can take your face. I can, again, run, run lots of copies in the system. It will extract out the special things that uh, describe your face. We can then build the reconstructor, the decoder of you feed those special things. So if you frowned, it can take that and then reconstruct a picture of you frowning. And now we've got a neural net that again can start with a picture of this case of you or whatever the target is, abstract out the key parts and then reconstruct it from those key parts. Now the secret sauce is the next step. The way these work is that the encoder, the thing that extracts out my special features and your special features are actually one and the same. So they turn out to build common features between us. The way that I smile and the way that you smile are abstracted out into make us smile. The way that I frown, that you frown, are extracted out into how we frown. Based on that, we can, as you might you know, foresee, be able to rearrange these. And now I can frown. It will take the fact that I'm frowning out into the common set of features that are common to both of us. We can take that frowning features, put it into the decoder for you, that is the thing that constructs you, and now we have a picture of you frowning. I have now become the master, you have now become the puppet, and I have now been able to do the deep fake of you. So having done all this, 
can you tell whether this has actually happened or not? Well, as it turns out, the answer kind of is yes and kind of is no. Uh, there are in fact many, many, many different ways that people have attempted to uh, detect whether a deep fake has happened or not. Um, they depend on a variety of special artifacts. Uh, we talk about you know, using my frown and having it appear on you. Well, you have a certain physiology that goes on as well. You have a certain heart rate, for example. Um, we can look at that heart rate uh, going on in you and see whether that makes sense with what you're saying. Is the audio in the, uh, vi and the video matching? Um, are, is there some sort of disconnect? So although uh, you know, we have some sort of frown, your frown and my frown really aren't the same. Does something there look very different? Um, there's uh, other kinds of analysis that can be done that don't have to do with either my frown or your frown at all. But when we use these kinds of systems, the math actually has residual kinds of fingerprints that it leaves in the generated uh, image. And so again, not visible to the human eye, but visible to the mathematician, you can go look for these kind of artificial artifacts that are sitting in the generated picture and say, you would only see that kind of frequency distribution if in fact one of these neural networks was the one building this image. This isn't a natural thing that would, you would see coming out of a camera or coming out of something else. And there's a variety of, of what are called forensic analysis that can be in order to do that. And if you look at the chart on the left, you can see some of the more uh, recent work that's been done. In fact, there's been a huge amount of work that's been done recently in order to build these kinds of detectors. Um, the good news is there's been a lot of work here. Um, the bad news is they all rely on really specific kinds of, um, I'll call it defects. Uh, and in practice, as fast as people are able to build detectors to find these kinds of defects, people who can generate the deep, deep fakes have found ways to generate things that don't have those defects. So the cat and mouse game continues. And so far, we haven't come up with a way that can reliably detect uh, deep fakes to an adversary who is specifically targeting themselves to be hidden from a particular kind of uh, detection technique. And as a result, there's huge numbers of deep fakes that are readily accessible that can be fed into systems to try to uh, subvert them. And uh, our attempt to look at them, and here's just some of the summary examples, I have not done very well. So uh, Facebook and others have put together a variety of deep fakes and tried various tools on them. Then you can see the best tool uh, could find about 70% of the time. Uh, most of the time is something like half of the time. And as a result, um, it's very easy to get fooled and very easy to slip by these kinds of systems. And this is without sort of I'd call a deep adversary specifically trying to uh, subvert and get around particular kind of detection techniques. So how does that actually play into uh, how things might go wrong? And now we have to understand a little bit more about how the constructed system uh, might be altered. So recall that uh, because of transfer learning, you can have bad artifacts that are introduced into the teacher be prevalent in the student. And the autoencoder is a way to build those kinds of artifacts that you can then insert. How might you insert it? Well, something called the supply chain. Think of the supply chain as the way that you build these systems. And it turns out that the software supply chain uh, is very prevalent in the industry. Uh, most software, including machine learning, or I should say, especially machine learning, is assembled. It's not built from scratch. There are large numbers of machine learning frameworks, large number of data sources. There's no real way to understand its provenance. There's no real way to understand, if you like, where the teacher really came from and how it's been manipulated before it gets to you. This has been the general attack scenario here has been brought to uh, uh, a lot of people's attention recently because of the solar winds attack. That was a supply chain attack. Same kind of philosophy. Obviously, the detailed tactics were different, but the same kind of philosophy of taking something which you think is benign and inserting something not benign into the program uh, on its way out the door. And as a result, in that case, uh, we had this bad code uh, shipped everywhere. I think in this particular scenario, you have the, uh, the, um, the bad generators uh, going out with other kinds of applications that were not intended to have them. Now, how might this happen? So we've, I gave you a couple of examples at the beginning. Um, 
frankly, I, I do not know in detail how the fake AI voice was done. Uh, most adversaries don't share that with us. But the other ones were done, I'd say, by largely amateurs using uh, pretty easily accessible technology. This stuff is now being used and developed commercially as well. So here's a couple of examples. It's being used for training. It's being used for marketing. Uh, if you look at just the example in the upper left-hand side, you can see, again, without going into a lot of details, that the general strategy of how to do the encoding and decoding, or here they call them embedders and generators, uh, follows along the same way in where you abstract out what you want and then apply those abstractions into the target that you want to manipulate. These companies are doing it for very good commercial reasons. And I certainly won't want to make any claim that these companies are doing anything bad. As far as I know, they are not. As far as I know, their technology has also not left the barns. That is, it's not available to others to be attacked within a supply chain. Uh, and to be honest, uh, because most companies won't share all of their secret sauce, I'm making a leap that they're using the same general kind of technology based on, for example, pictures like you see here that I've been talking about. Um, that's what the literature is filled with, and therefore I think it's a reasonable assumption to use it. My point is that there is a lot of this technology is available, and one might expect, just like in solar winds, that you have commercial technology that gets out there, that there will probably be some time in where these kinds of very good quality, high-grade fake generations will make its way out as well. And so as a result, you could adulterate the teacher by embedding a master that can control any target, put me in there, and now I can control any of the uh, if you like uh, trainers that come out of the training system, or I could change a target if you have something that's always generating uh, a particular kind of individual, uh, then uh, anyone might be able to manipulate them. And hiding is easy because, as I mentioned, the space here is so sparse. So how might you manage that? Well, reducing the supply chain risk factors is a reasonably well understood approach. It's not easy, but it's understood. You basically improve the, the security of the supplier, of the product the supplier is building, the distribution of the product, and its operation. So in this case, it means understanding in the data science world what the provenance was. Where did that teacher come from? Who's had their hands on it? And how was it built? Do you have any trust that it was the people building it knew what they were doing or did they just download something off the web and make modifications and therefore you don't really know where it came from? You know whether the product itself is reliable. And this in some sense is using some of that fingerprinting that I was alluding to before. I used the word phrasing salting. I commented there are certain forensic things that exist by which you can look for it. You can actually deliberately put those in there and then see whether the product that you've got, the neural network that you've got, has been manipulated or not, because those artifacts will be different or they'll disappear entirely. So you can, in effect, if you like salt, leave things that are in there that can let you know that the product that you got hasn't been manipulated. You can sign it to make sure that uh, the, uh, the distribution channel hasn't done things. And the last one, which is frankly the most difficult, is education. Uh, as we have more and more different fakes of various kinds, people need to understand, uh, first of all, how they were created to know whether that there was a uh, chance that it was faked or not, and just to understand um, common sense uh, context. Um, if you have someone who says something they've never said before, um, if, the pers if the place where the source came from is completely unreliable, you've never heard of them, um, if there's no second source for something, those are all kind of operational controls which by education, you can say, this doesn't make any sense. I don't believe that. I see uh, uh, Mickey Mantle saying this. Mickey Mantle hasn't been around for a while. I don't think he can be talking about Facebook. Specifically, uh, in the product and the supplier, you need to be careful of uh, insiders. Um, insiders have the most access to change the models, to change the training data. And for that, again, there's pretty well understood uh, approaches to manage the insiders, how you put processes into the organization, the kind of tools you use to manage it, and much of the time training. Uh, most insiders are really quite accidental. They don't realize they're making uh, bad decisions. And with training, that can be ameliorated. Finally, on the operations, this has to do with understanding whether you really can trust something or not. People are using this, and it's true that right now these systems are opaque. You really can't see how they're doing their things. And as a result, there are some misgivings, at least in the business world. Uh, but in the, in the uh, so I'll call it the public world, uh, people are less um, discriminating about whether they accept the outputs or not. If it came from the computer, if they see it on YouTube, they think it's for real. 
And so we need to have both better explanations of how things were generated, and we just need to carry out more kinds of education and have people experience what these things look like, what are good ones, what are bad ones, in order to recognize when uh, something has been manipulated. Uh, people right now already understand airbrushing, that this you know, particular actress really did have crow's feet on some particular day, and now they can, you know, not fooled by that at all. But uh, this has to be extended as well. So what we've done, we've described about some potential problems that have happened, explained how transfer learning works as a way that these things can be introduced, problems can be introduced, in particular, what the autoencoder-based deepfake generation looked like, and therefore, that's the kind of thing which might be inserted. There's a lot of work on detection. It's not quite up to snuff yet, but it's something that uh, we need to continue to work on and realize how this gets in through the supply chain used to build these kinds of transfer learning applications. Hope you've uh, learned some more things about Deepfake today. I appreciate you being here. And here is how you can engage us. We have a lot of research in this area. By all means, please contact us. Please contact me and we'd be happy to let you know more. Great, have a great day. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for sharing those incredible insights with us. We really appreciate you sharing. All right, if you're looking for your next session, you can go ahead and check out your agenda page to see where you're going next or take some time to connect with your peers with some virtual networking. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.